I'm Mike Brilla, host of the Inspired Teacher Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. Judith Peck, Professor Emirata of Art at Rapopo College in New Jersey, author of several fiction and nonfiction works, and a sculptor is back. That's right. Today we're focused on her book, Dynamic Play and Creative Movement, Powering Body and Brain, which is focused on helping parents and teachers enliven and enrich education. Such a cool book. You're going to learn so much, and you're going to want to get the kids working on uh, being more active instead of looking at that uh, cell phone uh, screen or that tablet screen or, or whatever other screen you got them looking at. So great stuff. Uh, great ideas. Very practical book. You're going to love this talk. And uh, by the way, before you go, it would be so cool if you uh, left me a re- review. Could you do that? I mean, you, you can do it in multiple ways, whether on the uh, podcast uh, uh, platform that you're listening to me on, uh, or you can uh, actually go to my website, stevemaletto.com slash reviews, and there's a place there that you just push the button and you can leave the review right there that'd be so cool what do you think uh see some nice words and uh leave me five stars hmm? <laughs> thanks so much you're so cool thanks for listening thanks for sharing and enjoy the show it's the education podcast your favorite show with lots of groovy guests and they share what they know so crank it up the tin and let your neighbors know that here's another show with dr steve Milletto. teaching learning leading k-12 Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, ah, with Dr. Steve Maletto. Dr. Judith Peck is Professor Emirata of Art, Ramapo College of New Jersey. She is author of several fiction and nonfiction works and a sculptor with work in 80 collections, including the Yale Gallery of Art, the Ghetto Fighters Museum in Israel, libraries, universities, and cultural and religious institutions here and abroad. Dr. Peck holds a doctoral degree from New York University and two master's degrees from Columbia University. She is recipient of the 2020 Albert Nelson Marquis Lifetime Achievement Award and has completed the first draft of a fourth novel about an art therapist who helped solve a school shooting. Judith grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. She has four grown children and 12 grandchildren and resides in Mawad, New Jersey. Images and videos of her sculpture can be viewed at jpecsculpture.com and descriptions of her books can be seen at iapbooks.com. Our focus today is on her book, Dynamic Play and Creative Movement, Powering Body and Brain. Uh, A little bit about her book. Dynamic Play and Creative Movement offers accessible methods to enliven and enrich education for young children from ages 4 to 11 using imagination, movement, and improvisation. Preschool and elementary grade teachers will find the material directly usable in their classrooms to foster creativity and cognitive understanding in children. Judith, thanks for joining me today. Great to have you back on the show again, and say hi to everyone. Hi to everyone. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you're back, and... uh, um, we got uh, we got a you got a new book out, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, that book today. It's called Dynamic Play and Creative Movement. You know, powering body and brain. So why'd you write it? Uh, I wrote this book uh, because I had discovered a very interesting fact about education and learning that children really become factory installed. You know, <laughs> and um, the idea is that. We don't use those three ingredients enough, physical energy, imagination, and this tremendous urgency for self-expression. And if we did that, children would be from the very start able to have a joyful kind of meaningful learning. And that's what I, uh, since I discovered that with my own kids and if my teaching as well, because I taught dance for a long time and creative movement. I would like to have all the people understand that, both parents and uh, early childhood educators and elementary school from about kindergarten through third grade. That's where they can most benefit. So awesome. And, uh, it's, and it's interesting, you know, one of the things that you have in your, in your book are, is pictures of kids using, I mean, a small amount of materials, but for the most part, their imaginations to be actively involved. And I, and I love that. Uh, so who are you trying to reach? Who's the audience that you want to talk to, that you want to listen to? You? Well, first I'd like to talk to parents, number one, uh, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And then I'd like to talk to elementary school teachers. So the book is for both of these classes of people. 
parents because from the various early earliest days they can you know engage their kids i mean stephen do you have any grandchildren or children or even great-grandchildren along the way or nieces and nephews that you've seen in the cradle because when you see them in the cradle you will have the very beginning notion of what this is all about. Do you have any such thing? Have you? you I know? have. I have two grown children. They're in the, the one's getting ready to turn thirty, and the other one's uh, twenty six. So uh, we're well, maybe uh, they have children. Then have they have babies that you that you can see in the cradle? Yeah, no? not not now. No, not yet. And uh, they're hopefully they're coming. We we keep having these discussions. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll find all out. Right, well, then let me describe it to you. A baby in the crib is moving every single limb, hands, arms, legs, neck, body. Uh, they're reacting to everything. They watch the mobile upstairs, their sight, their scent, their sound, uh, their smell even. They can recognize the mother by sm smell from the very beginning of birth, you know, as soon as they emerge. <laughs> and so um, they are using their imagination in order to be able to process what's going on. They use their limbs and their body, their physical energy, and of course they use their urgency for self-expression. They're screaming or gurgling, one or the other, uh, all the time. So these are the three things they're learning from. They were, you know, they should have been there in the womb three months earlier or three months longer, you know, than they are, because I guess the uh, female pelvic system is not able to uh, have them uh, wait three months longer to emerge. Uh, and so, therefore, they are babies. The um, longest, uh, they take the longest time to learn uh, to be able to be on their own of any other species, a human baby. So, um, that's an interesting thing that we have to nurture them longer uh, than any other animal or bird or insect. Uh, uh, so, they use, that's why they're factory installed with those three things that can help them along. Uh, so anyway, so parents uh, can, in the very beginning, help children to do things for themselves, like learning to dress and learning uh, it, it to uh, it do things that they feel they're good at. Uh, and you do things by using imagination. Uh, you can, for example, imitate a bear going through a cave when they put one leg through a trouser leg and then the other leg through the trouser leg. And, and you can make images like that uh, for them uh, to be able to uh, say, gee, I can do this. This is fun. And this fun that goes into learning is one of the greatest things that you can begin to give a, a child. So I'm urging parents from the very beginning to use their own imagination to be able to make these metaphors and that these descriptive things that children uh, will easily then be able to see because they're full of imagination, full of physical activity, all those things we talked about. And then they also want to talk about uh, what they're doing and seeing. When you start like that, the child begins to say, hey, I'm pretty good at this. What's next? What's next? What's next? And go on to the next. So that's what I'd like to start with the parents being able to reinforce uh, by using those three ingredients, children's love and joy of learning. And then when they get to school, I'll talk about other things that, that can be done using, again, imaginative ways of, 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 of retrieving information. Love it. The, you know, at the beginning of Dynamic Play, you note... Uh, you say this, creative energy, dynamic, fired by imagination. This is the energy of children. Can you take this just a little bit further? I can. Uh, you know, it's, it's like this is what you want them to be able to uh, start with, not logic and reasoning. And yet when we sit them down at the desks, uh, it's all logic and reasoning we want to propel on them. Take, for example, let's call him Eddie. He's sitting in his chair in the, in the uh, schoolroom. He's looking out the window. He's distracted because he sees a squirrel climbing up a tree. And the tree is very high, and the squirrel is way high in it. And he says, my God, how does the squirrel have such courage to be up there like that and swing from one twig to another, a twig that can barely hold his weight? And then off he goes. So he's thinking about that. And he's saying, well, what makes the tree so big in the first place? And how come it doesn't fall over? You know, what's, what's holding it up? 
So he has all these images that are going through his mind as he's looking because uh, his imagination is going full swing when reasoning is just at the starting gate. You know what I mean? (laughs) So that's why uh, a, a teacher who's able to start from where the child is and that physical energy of him, he can't stand sitting in the chair. You know yourself, if a kid can run, he's going to run and not walk if he has a clear space. If he's sitting at a, at a table, his leg is swinging all the time under that table. Uh, <laughs> a kid needs to move. So why not get him up, stand the whole class up, and let's do some first some stretching exercises so they got the body moving. And by the way, my book has many, many ways of imaginative ways of moving the arms and the head the legs and the feet, the torso, the head and the neck, and all with imaginations, um, with ideas of animal, human, man-made, and nature-made literature, uh, all at my, uh, uh, at my sleeves that I can use uh, to be able to get the child moving all these parts. And then uh, the teacher, you know, might feel a little bit, self-conscious and all that but uh you know as long as uh, nobody else is in the room <laughs> and no adult is in the room the kids don't mind and they will see her fine or, you know okay she doesn't have to uh, do exercise that'll be hard to get off the floor with but uh, there are many other places that the teacher should feel unself-conscious and just move with the kids uh, to do some of these things and of course everything is spelled out in the book from beginning to end, how to do it exactly. So there's no making things up as you go along, except for the imaginings, but the body itself and how to move it is all spelled out in the book. I love it. It's, um, it's, it's so practical in getting them moving and uh, doing, and and uh, we'll talk about this more in a little bit, but uh, yeah, you really, it's not a whole lot of resources you have to have except for good ma- imaginations and, and helping to guide them into what they need to be doing. So, so one of the terms that you use throughout this is the word is, is the term dynamic play. So can you tell us more about what dynamic play means? Right. Well, dynamic has with it the whole notion of movement. You know, dynamic is energy. Dynamic is movement. Dynamic uh, is purposeful also. So all these things are, are uh, involved in. And when I looked at the Rutledge catalog, just to give you an idea of how to get the book, you know, I saw there was quite a few uses of the word dynamic. I thought I had invented it for this, uh, for this type of uh, learning, but it isn't in my invention, it turns out. It was my invention for myself, but other teachers and leaders and educators have been using it. Uh, now, uh, we have learned, Stephen, a tremendous correlation between movement and the brain, and my book now uh, has a lot of research connected with it about how the brain and uh, connects with movement. And if I might say a word about the brain now. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. A little diversion is that the brain wants to do what you want it to do. It's like having a protective nurturing mother with you forever from birth to death. Nice. Somebody that is there with you wants to do only what you want it to do. Now, how does it know what you want it to do? That's the question. By what you've done before, all those neural connections have been working all along, synaptic connections. And the more you have ventured out with your curiosity to learn and to do, the more resources the brain has to work for you. So it's really fascinating uh, to to see that and to understand uh, so that if you can Knowing the relationship between movement and cognition, knowing that the brain has always been working with your movements, your actual physical movements, to uh, accelerate, to make more neural connections, and to do all that, you know that you've got to get out there and be curious and and then um, venture into those realms and then retrieve the information. And that's where retrieval Uh, comes into it with the brain and movement connection. So that's what I'd like to to see parents and educators use more of, which is what the kids already have in store, ready to go. 
packaged. <laughs> so I don't, uh, you know, now that, get them up from those desks and get them on their feet. Love that. And yeah. dance is a wonderful way to do it. You know, we don't want to call it dance per se because dance seems so uh, different uh, and a whole other cultural activity to use, but it isn't. It's using the body in rhythmic ways and in uh, cognitive ways to do what you want it to do. So awesome. So, it's, and it's, it's, you know, it, you know, you think about uh, if nothing else, just simply getting them to interact in a way in which they're not just sitting there looking at a screen or, uh, well, especially inter- just looking at, at uh, some sort of screen and that's what they're doing all day. And uh, um, to get them moving around and using their imagination, which is so, so powerful. And, it, you know, one of the things I wanted to bring up is could you talk just a little bit about what imagination does for a child's development prior to age 11, why it's, why it should be encouraged to use their imagination. Yeah. And you know, at age 11, uh, it turns off. That's the thing. In other words, you, you have this ability to use those three ingredients, physical and a physical movement, imagination, and the urge for self-expression, uh, easily, uh, from three to about age 10. Uh, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about, how in the school it can work and why it works well. If you start with engendering the self-confidence in a kid to be able to move freely, and you do that, and I'll talk to the educators now, of sitting in a circle, talking about what you want to uh, do, what the project is, the expression of it, and have all the children contribute ideas uh, and have those ideas accepted. Uh, let's say, um, for example, the project is nature uh, and all the things that live and work and produce underground or low to the ground. Let's say that's your project, just for an example. There's many, many projects in the book, but let's say that's. So then the, the children will all contribute what is low to the ground, worms and bugs and and uh, uh, tree roots and things like that. And then uh, children might be asked, well, how would you do that with your body? How would you do that? And a kid might get up and and make some movements and all that. And then uh, you might even institute a little applause. Why not? Uh Uh-huh. A little applause for each one. Uh, And they go up and more and more are encouraged to do that. But every time a child's idea is accepted, like he names something under the ground that hasn't been talked of, how about rocks? Rocks are underground. And, uh, and thinking of other things, squirmy things that work underground, how about molds that only come out at a certain time? And each of these things might be interpreted and might be discussed. But as the idea is accepted, the child begins to gain confidence in himself that he is worthy that he, his ideas are valuable, that he has value. This is the most wonderful thing for joyful learning. You just want to project other ideas that other people accept. Uh, so it's, it's, it has a universal benefit well beyond the project itself. And then, of course, you can work in groups. Isn't it wonderful to be able to work in a group with your peers? Kids don't get an opportunity to do that successfully enough, you know, you'll find people sitting with you at the lunch (laughs) where they weren't before. All kinds of wonderful happenings can happen when you feel confident in yourself and you feel that you're accepted uh, by a group. So uh, uh, that's one thing I'd like educators to, to be able to do that process of the group engagement. And then you could go on to do the actual project itself. Very nice. You know, and, You know, one of the things that uh, your book includes is descriptions, activities, and uh, how to go about uh, doing some of these, uh, um, using these activities with the kids to to get them a chance to use their imaginations, to get up and move around. And, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to to see is, uh, you know, at this point, there is a... uh, um, there's a note to the reader that there are no materials required to engage the kids. And I was just wondering if you could talk just a little bit about that. Oh, that's such a wonderful point, Stephen. You always bring up these little essential things. <clears throat> there is only your body, right? right? You have a body and you need a floor space. 
you have a floor space. Now, in the book, we go over, uh, as I mentioned before earlier, uh, ways uh, to move your arms. Let's say we're starting with the arms and hands. Well, you could imagine all kinds of things. How about you imagine yourself your paint? Uh, an artist, you're on the palette, the actual paint on the palette, and you can dip yourself into all kinds of colors and make an interpretation of a, of a color red, for example, or a color yellow. And kids love to make these interpretations in nature and in man-made uh, life about these things. And you splatter, how about the space? What kind of space? You want to go sideways? You want to go diagonally? You want to plunge forward? You want to dip yourself low into the paint and then high up and paint in the sky? Your canvas is everything. Your canvas is anything you want it to be. And then you transfer all that into your arms, moving, and your head following and your legs following your arms where the paint is going. So that's one thing. Uh, and then let's say you want those legs to move. Well, maybe you're a fancy circus pony, you know, with the legs, you know, and your knees high up in the air as you travel along. Uh, and uh, you could do leaping over stones, perhaps, and don't fall in the water, you'll get wet and all kinds of things. So these imaginary things are still there while you use every single part of your body, uh, low to the ground, like those things underground, high up, like the kite flying in the air, even. Uh, and um, all these things are easy for children. That's what I wanted to impress uh, on your your uh, viewers, Stephen, how, how quickly a child will accept these things if he has the confidence to move without embarrassment. And kids do move without embarrassment unless, unless they're not accepted and they're told, you know, hold back. And we're always telling kids to hold back for one reason or another, and rightfully so, we have to. But there are times when you have to let them free, you know, to move and to fly. I like that. My though. first book on this topic was called Leap to the Sun, Learning Through Dynamic Play. That was published by Prentice Hall years ago, and I understand it's still being used a lot. But, of course, this book, which builds on that to show the research now between cognitive understanding and uh, a physical movement, uh, is now included. That's excellent. You know, one of the... One of the things I, without having done a lot of research, I mean, one of the things that is difficult about this is that not not what you're talking about, but in a uh, kid's world as it is, is that a lot of it's all dictated about specifically about how you're supposed to do something. Or if, you, if you're looking at a computer screen, what's happening is it's telling you how to go about moving through the whatever it is you're looking at and, uh, you know, here are the steps to do and stuff like this. And, you know, the idea that uh, they would actually be asked to be a paintbrush that's trying to paint the sky or, you know, the idea that you're, you're a bear moving through the, you know, the woods or something like this is, uh, is cool. You know, it's one of the things that, uh, you know, I remember fondly, uh, especially in the first and second grade kindergarten through those times, and it's a group of friends and, you know, the playground became, it became space and, um, and the, the merry-go-round, whatever they're called, the thing that spins and you get dizzy and it can fly off, <laughs> um, that they tend not to make them anymore. But, uh, that was our, that was our starship enterprise. And, you know, we play, you played on that and we did a lot of, uh, you know, using the imagination to, to be and do, and, you know, we're, we'd spin and then now we're now we're on a planet and stuff like this. And I think about, uh, um, how much you, you know, you just kind of left to your own devices as long as you stayed within the confines of the playground. And, uh, right. Well, you know, you touched on so many things there. I'd like to fly off myself on one <laughs> of them. Do you remember? Well, now, uh, just recently, there was a hero on the school bus who actually saw the driver having trouble and yes. came right up to the uh, driver. And, and touched his wheel, put his foot on the brake, it engaged the bus so that it would not crash. And how he did that, you, you saw that, a news article, yes, right? Yes, yes, okay. it is. How he did that, he was asked, he said, well, I have no iPhone. And everybody else was looking in their iPhone. That is the remarkable thing about it. They were not situationally aware. And what you just touched on 
are is also being situationally aware of what's going on around you. You could not even look at the clouds and get an interpretation or begin to interpret uh, vehicles, man-made things that are, or the road itself and structures around you if you weren't looking out the window at all and looking only at those iPhones, which you just, you, you know, you mentioned. Uh, so, and that playground that you mentioned, this is also a way of moving. Uh, moving. These are wonderful things to do, whether you're exercising per se or just playing around, you are still moving and all those things are engaged with your cognitive understanding. So um, we have to get them off those iPhones a little bit, not only uh, for the, we, the reasons we were just discussing, but for obeseness because obesity, because uh, the very opposite is true how much movement is connected with cognitive understanding, the absolute opposite is to how much you're losing if you're not moving. It's, it's wild. You know, it's uh, something that, uh, you know, that the whole idea of, a, you know, going back to that energy that you talked about, that, that it's part of them. And, and if they're, you know, if instead what's happening, they're, they're being encouraged to, you know, kind of become connected to the couch or something, you know, this is, uh, uh, it, it's not going to, it's not going to benefit their health very much. You know, it, you know, one of the things that uh, um, you talk about in your book is this um, movement, whether in the form of exercise or physical play stirs neural activity in the brain, which helps to support brain plasticity. So can you go in a little more detail? Because I think that's kind of where we were going there. Right. Uh, well, you know, um, brain, uh, brain plasticity uh, has to do with neural connections, of that, you know, synaptic connections. And uh, you, uh, you know, a lot of research has been done about how that actually does work. Uh, so, um, but they're, they're finding that these neural connections are activated with movement. That's, and as the person, they can, they can see the pathways in the brain that are working. And it turns out that the same pathways of the brain, the same part of the brain that uh, is responsible for learning is responsible for movement. Isn't that interesting? The same part of the brain. And so they, they can tell now all fine signs of things by um, seeing inside the brain and seeing exactly what lights up when, uh, when you have certain thoughts even, as well as certain movements. So through that uh, ability to be able to see inside the brain, we're learning about these connections and, uh, and how plus brain plasticity is very important because that's what makes one neuron connect to the next one and all that. That's what plasticity is. So the more that you can get that activated, uh, the more you can learn and be smart. <laughs> like that. like that a lot. That's, uh, why, not, why not be smart instead of not smart? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, comes up in your, in your book is this kind of concept of, you know, if they're only hearing, don't move, like for example, don't do that, stop it. <laughs> you know, what sort of thoughts are there that about what this has on a child's development? If that's all they hear about when all they hear when they're moving about is, Hey, stop that. Stop that. No, 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 no. You know, that type of thing. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I, uh, you, you pointed on the three, the no controls, you know, they're not, they're not doing something neat and order, neat and order. And oh, the no controls, but, uh, it's actually just an emanation of those three ingredients that we talked about that I call endowments that children are factory installed with the physical activity usually results in stop doing that. Stop it. Stop it. Stop doing that. And then the imagination uh, you know, about uh, I mean, what's going on? What are you talking about? What, what is that nonsense? You, you know, and then, of course, uh, the uh, last part, the expression, stop that racket, stop that commotion, <laughs> stop that racket. So it's always, you're right, to stop that thing, because that's how we see it very often. And it's true. That's how it, it does come forth. So you want to channel those three wonderful endowments into learning, which you can easily do because the kids are ready and ever they're ready for it. I love it. We have to, we as parents and educators have to be ready to to channel that energy and really use it into learning. 
So much so, you know, it's it's funny. I uh, I have this memory of my grandmother's yard, where my grandparents' yard, where there was a Japanese plum tree, and the Japanese plum tree was neat because it had just the right types of space between the branches <laughs> to be able to climb in the middle of it. And so, if the adults were, uh, you know, distracted, you know, next thing you know, is Steve's up in the Japanese plum tree. <laughs> And what are you doing? Get get down. Stop, 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 stop. Get down there. Well, the funny yeah. thing is my grandfather's the one who taught me to do it. <laughs> so he, he showed me how to how I could do this and make this happen. And it's just kind of funny because. Uh, yeah, but look, Stephen, look how brave you were to go in that tree and all of that. In other words, you you had, a, you were absent those NO controls at that point, right? Right. Uh -huh. So anyway, yeah, that's good. And your energy took you up to your physical energy and all that. Oh, that it did. And what's funny is that I don't know. I'm not too fond of climbing in trees when I have to today. It's like, it's a, save that for All right, rest. everything in its place. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, with one of the things that you talk about in your book, there's, there's a statement. I want to go into a little more detail. It goes like this. With the development of a rich physical vocabulary, children can be both original in their improvisations and honest in their expressions. Original because an endless variety of interesting movements can be created. Honest because cliche patterns are not copied. Could you go into a, explain okay. this? I'm so glad you mentioned that. As usual, you always hit on such interesting topics. You ask a child to imitate a butterfly, right? And they would go around flapping their wings like that, flapping their wings and all that. That is a cliche. It doesn't at all describe the color of the butterfly. The way the butterfly floats into the ground, you know, it doesn't just, the way it floats into the ground, the way it rises, uh, there is so much pattern on those leaves as well, of uh, the butterfly leaves so are and so on. So you, once you begin to sit, sit down and discuss and see in your mind's eye what the butterfly really looks like, what the, what the butterfly really flies like, and again, sitting on the ground, each child giving an idea, because they have seen a butterfly, or else they've, uh, you know, book even if they haven't seen it, it literally, uh, then some children stand up and interpret what a color would be, which kind of colors are there, and how it comes down, and how it rises from low to high. You might even want to look at the monarch butterfly and see what kind of butterflies are they and how they are sustained. A teacher can bring in all kinds of information about how, as a matter of fact, right now we're, we're in danger of losing the butterflies because they don't have the habitat to be able to uh, to sustain them and all this. All these things can be brought into the lesson. An elephant, the first thing a child will do is the trunk, you know, and they'll swing back and forth with this heavy thing hanging around them, you know, whereas there's so much more to an elephant, the actual bulk of an elephant itself, you know, are the flapping ears and the way the elephant moves with his feet big, heavy trunks of trunky feet are moving in addition to the actual trunk. So in other words, and then you learn so much more and you have such a, an affinity with that animal. So that's what I'm trying to show with the uh, ability to discuss it, to move with it, to move like it, and then to go beyond. What else can you learn from this particular animal and the project itself? I love that. You know, it's... Uh... And once again, I got to go back to this. It's all about asking them to think about this and, and show and you'd use their thoughts about what they would think. And sure enough, I, I can only imagine that the first thing most kids would think about, and most adults would, if you ask adults the same thing, it's they got to have a trunk, right? There's, what's, a, what's an elephant without, uh, without a trunk? So usually you go there first. And, and then it's a cliche, right? Yeah. Right. I do want to get into some of the actual projects uh, that are done and how we can expand uh, these when we get, and we've done all this, we do all this first, right. uh, all the things that you talked about first, and then we can actually visit a museum, for example. This is all imaginary, so it doesn't matter, but the teacher can bring in, and nowadays it's easy to bring in because you go on site uh, to the actual Metropolitan Museum and they'll let you take anything out, you know, and they'll let you show anything digitally as well. And these interpretations of the famous uh, portraits and famous uh, landscapes and uh, uh, famous um, 
actually artifacts too can be interpreted. So that's one thing in nature itself, of course, and in the history lesson, how about the science lesson? Uh, you can bring that to life. Uh, even something that happened uh, in, uh, in military history can be brought to life. You know, kids would, the more active kids and the more, <laughs> the more bullying kids would love that, you know, and engaging in a military flight, a fight of some kind, you know, uh, historically. So in other words, everything can be brought in once you, you venture into and you know how to move your arms and legs and you go off the cliche images, you begin to see it in your mind's eye and interpret it with your body uh, and think literally about what it is you're doing being situationally aware, like we talked before, all things then can uh, can be interpreted and brought into your cognition and your learning experience. It's so awesome. It really is. I mean, you got it. Uh, it just it explains itself about why you would want to encourage this with uh, whether a parent or a te classroom teacher uh, giving opportunities to expand uh, their use of their thoughts and their ideas and moving around and jumping around and, and doing the things that make them uh, make part of whatever it is in their imagination. They're making come alive, come alive. And I love that. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, um, I'd like you to comment about is what thoughts would you share with a parent about including movement and play during the day, especially if there's only one child? So it's good to have more than one child. Actually, you can do it with one child. You can have a birthday party, by the way, for that one child. Bring in lots of people. Use the book and pick any project you want to and have a, uh, uh, have a terrific party out of it. Of course, you know, I'm troubled by the one thing, and you touched on it before, about this concentration on the iPhones and young children looking at cartoons on these uh, cell phones or whatever you want to call them. I mean, uh, I, I've seen whole families have their entire children, uh, their entire um, flock of children, whether it's uh, they're with a group or whether it's their own siblings, uh, just attend only to that phone. Their eyes are on the phone uh, and they're missing something. So we have to talk about the other side of things. You know, how do we stop them? How do we get them? to put them down and be, be, have fun in the own, their own environment. I mean, I don't know how to do that yet. I, I can need tutelage on that. We'll keep, work, uh, keep working on that. that. <laughs> on how, well, I see one thing we, this, this book actually can help them do that. It, it can get them excited about what's going on in their own mind and their own brain and how their body can actually bring that to the fore and how other kids can accept it you know, and say, hey, that's good. That's a good idea. That's the way to do it. I've answered my own question. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love it because that's, you know, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, just, just, just removing them from that, you know, uh, a parent recognizing that maybe they need to do something else instead of just sit there and looking at it. And I know, I know the phone keeps them quiet <laughs> and I know the phone keeps them, you know, focused in one area and you're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to find them right where you left them because they're sitting there looking at that screen. But at the same time, it kind of, not kind of, it stymies the, that creative process that uh, they might be, you know, thinking about this, that, or the other, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of a cartoon called Calvin and Hobbes. And, and it's the same thing. The cartoons are the same thing. They're looking at the same thing. And they, you can practically predict how Bugs Bunny are going to end up in the wall. Of course. The wall. You know, these things are, if you talk about cliches, cliches in movement, it's cliches in these things. It's over and over again the same thing, the same colors even, uh, and not getting into your own brain. So we have to really do something about this. And not only that, but as they get older, the internet can be very dangerous as we know they they put things on the internet and they can't take them off and they're ashamed and then we get into other things which is beyond the scope of this book and beyond me like teen suicide which is so so unbelievably rampant right now uh, so self-image is so important and when we can start with a good self-image by feeling that you are important by feeling that you have value by feeling that you, what you learn is valuable and what you can produce and share 
with others is valuable. This whole thing from the start makes you withstand, allows you to withstand the barrage of criticism that's going to come in from outside. Inevitably, you are going to be criticized. Inevitably, you're going to not measure up to a certain group, a clique, or whatever it is. So you have to be strong enough within yourself to be able to withstand all that by saying, you know, I'm okay, I'm all right. And when I sit alone at the lunch counter, I can uh, read a book or I can look around and see what others are doing. All kinds of resources can come to the fore if you have that foundation. That's why I want to start parents early on uh, with uh, giving their kids uh, this kind of confidence by being good at what they do. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's so incredible to you know just providing a, a resource to help parents and and teachers in the early ages help them get to uh, um, recognizing that it, it all you're doing is you're figuring out how to engage, interact with a child in a way in which they use that imagination and move about the room and and do the things that keep them you know actually part of our world. I, I mean, I've watched there's a there's a couple. Uh, commercials on TV right now that are hilarious because it shows somebody almost getting hit because they're just looking at their phone and they, you know, they blame the driver. They don't blame the, <laughs> themselves, but yeah, that's right. That's so true. And you know, the key is really looking at your kids and seeing what they do. Well, this business of physical movement right. and imagining yeah. things and, and, and wanting to talk about it. If you using that, just simply using that and, it's already there. You don't have to invent it and you don't have to uh, hang them on the head to be able to use it. Of course, music is another area. I'd love to see more. Uh, I mean, uh, sports too. Uh, the idea of sports is all movement and it's, it has other ingredients like competitiveness and being able to shine sometimes and being able to, do, uh, to accept losing. Uh, and sometimes you lose, sometimes you win and all these. So, those areas, learning music, doing sports, uh, participating in dramatic plays, uh, all these things are very, uh, are stimulating those uh, neural connections as well as using what the kid has plenty of. Yeah, it's so, it's just awesome. I love it. And great book, easy to read, easy to understand and put to use right now, which is awesome. You don't have to, you don't have to have all this stuff. You just kind of look at it and say, Hey, here's, there's some activities I'm going to try and you can try it right then or the next day, which I love. Um, before we close, do you want to remind everybody where they could uh, go to, to connect with you find out some more? Yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, the, those, that book we're talking about this whole hour is Rutledge is the publisher. Uh, it's easy to remember route, R-O-U-T, but without the E, ledge, L-E-D-G-E, Rutledge. And you can just add my name, Judith Peck, will summon the book and, and another book I've written there. All These were just published. It's copyright 2023, published uh, just the end of 2022. And um, the name is Dynamic Play. Um, and you will be able to find it at Rutledge. Uh, by just by inserting my name as the author uh, or even the word dynamic will bring, bring that book up too. Very cool. <laughs> I will include this information in my show notes. So it's easy for them to come back and find. So good stuff before you, before we uh, finish also, I wanted to know if you want to just remind people that they can see your, you have um, your sculpture on display. And I was wondering right. if you could tell them about that. Sure. Uh, oh, uh, my sculpture, a lot of it uh, is in bronze, wood, stone, fiberglass. All can be seen on jpecsculpture.com. jpecsculpture.com, P-E-C-K. Uh, and uh, there's, there's some videos there of me talking about the work. And the current display uh, that Stephen is talking about is on Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza in New York City at 47th Street and 2nd Avenue. I have four steel sculptures, life size over life size, uh, there, and I call them Ladies of Steel. One is a dog walker, and uh, she's a full length lady, white, walking a dog, and three other steel sculptures in black. Uh, so that's there through August. Uh, so you'll be able to see her there, all these sculptures there, and of course, many in the book. My sculptures are all about people. And uh, again, there's that integration. I used to teach dancing all the time and do sculpture. That's what I did. I taught dancing, but I do sculpture. Now, as a professor emeritus of art, 
uh, at, a, at the state college uh, um, in the fine arts uh, more so. But, you know, all these arts relate. They all coordinate and relate. And uh, the kid is at a uh, age from 3 to 11 where they want to take it all in. Music, fine art, dramatics, uh, as I said, sports as well. So, you know, you know, you will have a lot of fun as a parent and an educator if you participate because your imagination is going to be sparked as well. I can't emphasize enough, Stephen, how valuable this is uh, for the parent and educator, let alone the fact that you are closer to the child because sharing imaginations is a wonderful thing. You know, I was sharing Stephen up there in that tree, you know, when I was sticking up there. And, and with, it, I guess it was tulips or something that you were, no, it was plums. Yes. I was picturing that ripe plum up there in the tree. So in other words, I engaged with him for just that one moment as he was telling me about that. And engaging with your child on that shared screen of imagination is, can be a lot more interesting than the iPod. <laughs> so much so. So much so. Uh, Judith, thanks so much for talking with me about your book, Dynamic Play and Creative Movement, Powering Body and Brain. Uh, what a timely topic and much needed advice for keeping learning engaging and fun. Wish the best in all you do. Thank you so very much. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching Learning Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching Learning Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.